welcome to the Marines Memorial. It's been a, it's been a heck of a two years, two years plus with the pandemic. And um, I'm happy to say, to use an aviation phrase, we are on course and on glide path. Thanks to you, our membership, and the support that we've received. General Nella being here is an absolute, is the cherry on the cake. And it's absolutely an honor for, to, for him to be here. And it really does set the tone for the speaker series. And in your handout, you'll see that there are a number of speaker series that we've got coming up. So the speaker series is now up and running. We've got folks, we've got folks in the hotel. Anybody who's been here who was here, say, six months ago, you can see the difference in just the vibe of the hotel. In fact, we've got, oh, Roger's back there, Michael's back there. You guys did get a round of applause, so I won't have applause again, but thank you. But, but we're back. We're back, and it is absolutely thanks to the membership that we're back. And I just want to say, give a, just a real quick before I introduce Pete, that uh, we are going to soon kick off the capital campaign. And as you look at this wonderful building, um, and in fact, I'm looking for, where is General Myatt? General Myatt was with the, there you are, sir. And you know, I often refer to this place as the house that Myatt built. But we're going to take the vision from General Vandergriff, General Myatt, General Hewley before me and here, and we're going to enhance this building. And we've got a design team up there. If you would all raise your hand right there. Jen, Chris, we've got a design team that has been in town. They actually got stuck. They're supposed to fly out today, but their plane got canceled, so they spend another night with us. I think it was they heard General Nella was on, so they wanted to hear his speech. But, uh, but what we're going to do is basically take and be, put a refresher on the... Uh, on the hotel, so when it's the Marines Memorial, but it is a veterans club, and we have as many sailors, as many airmen, as many soldiers as we do Marine veterans that are members here. And so have, we got soldiers, soldier, veterans in the crowd, soldiers, raise your hand, anyone? Sailors? Okay, we got a couple of sailors. So we're gonna have a, we have, we're gonna have a Marine floor where you step off the elevators and you step onto yellow footprints. Anybody who's been to Marine Corps knows what those represent. We're gonna have a Navy floor we're going to have an army floor. We're going to take our memorabilia from the army, that all that we've got. We're going to go ask the membership from, who are soldiers to donate memorabilia that they have, sailors to donate memorabilia that they have. And there'll be a Navy floor. There'll be an Air Force floor. There'll be a floor for Korea and to represent Korea and Vietnam. And we've got Don Reed, a Korean War veteran here. We're going to have an OIF OEF floor that's going to represent our start with the Twin Towers and our end, which is the pullout of Kabul. And we're going to basically refresh from the top, on, from the top to the bottom. And, uh, and again, it's just another sign that we are back and uh, thrilled to be here. So without further ado, what I would like to, uh, for the Marines in the crowd, how many of you have been to 8th and I to see the Friday night parades? A bunch, right? Well, this next gentleman, you may not know the name, but it's Pete Wilson. He's going to moderate. If you were to just close your eyes and listen to his voice, you'll recognize him because he is the voice if you went to see a, a, a parade over the past number of years at the 8th and I, and he just recently retired, Pete was the voice. He's an accomplished musician. Most, first and foremost, he's a Marine, but he's an accomplished musician, and he was the voice of 8th and I. So when he volunteered to do this, he's here in San Francisco. He's uh, retired and living in the area. And of course, we said, oh, General Nell is going to be here, and he jumped on it for his old boss to come here and be part of this. So without further ado, please join me to a warm Marines Memorial uh, foundation welcome for Pete Wilson. Good evening and welcome to Marine Barracks, Wash oh, I'm sorry. Oh man, I brought the wrong script again. No, but seriously, uh, Lieutenant General Rocco and his wife Susan, thank you so much for having, having me here. It's, it's great to be living on the left coast now after having spent 30 years in DC. Uh, now with my new wife Jennifer and my stepson Leo is here and uh, we just love it here in San Francisco and became a member of the Marines Memorial as soon as I got here and uh, so I'm just so thrilled this is my first event getting to moderate and so without further ado I'm gonna I'm gonna introduce our big speaker today our speaker today served 44 years as a United States Marine officer completing his extraordinary career as the 37th Commandant of the Marine Corps Prior to serving as Commandant, General Neller was in highly impactful leadership roles, including Commander of Marine Forces Command, Commander of Marine Forces Central Command, and Director of Operations on the Joint Staff at the Pentagon. A native of East Lansing, Michigan, 
General Neller graduated from the University of Virginia. He was commissioned as an infantry officer in 1975 and went on to command units from platoon to division level, including the 3rd Light Armored Infantry Battalion, the 6th Marine Regiment, and the 3rd Marine Division. And he took part in operations Just Cause, Promote Liberty, Restore Hope, Iraqi Freedom, and Enduring Freedom. His senior command experience also includes duties as Deputy Commanding General of 1st Expeditionary Force Forward during OIF, Assistant Division Commander for 1st and 2nd Marine Divisions, and President of the Marine Corps University. Currently, General Neller serves as Chairman of the Board of the Marine Corps Scholarship Foundation, and he is an active corporate consultant, serving as an advisory board member for several companies, while also a distinguished senior fellow at the University of Texas, Austin. On a personal note, I had the honor of providing after-dinner musical support for General and Mrs. Neller many times. I was privileged to announce his retirement ceremony in 2019, and I was proud to lead a string quartet for his son's wedding, all of which took place in the home of the Commandants in Washington, D.C. And finally, just to add a little insider info, the General is a big fan of Star Trek, <laughs> loves Zach Brown Band, and I just learned that he is really into baseball cards and collecting them. So there you go. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Marines Memorial, General Robert B. Neller. Okay, I don't, I don't do speeches. I did a speech once in New York at an event that my staff wrote me a speech and I read it and Bing West was there and he grabbed me afterwards, he goes, that was terrible. You're the commandant, you can't do any better than that? And at first I got a little upset, I got indignant, and I went back and I wrote this nasty email back to him, and after a while I thought, he said, you know what? He was right, it was terrible. I can't read a speech. So I'm not gonna give you a lecture tonight. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you, and, and even though Colonel Tavuchis and General Rocco took up a lot of my time, I will stay here as long as you want because my plane doesn't leave till tomorrow morning. And so I've got nowhere to go and if you have to leave, that's fine. If you want to stay and talk, that's fine. Uh, this, this is a brief I put together, it kind of goes around the world. It's, it's, and I just noticed as I went through the preparation, I kind of, this was, I didn't have anything in there about Ukraine and Russia and uh, we can talk about that. But uh, as Pete said, I was a Marine for 44 years. I was in infantry. General Myatt was my division commander when I was CO of 3rd, then LAI, not LAR. And if he remembers, if he remembers, I remember one day he came up and spent the whole day with us because we were the headquarters for the Special Purpose MAGTAF, and he wanted to make sure that we were ready. And uh, so I'll never forget the fact that, you know, nobody came to 29 Palms to see anybody. <laughs> But he was our division commander, and he came up there to see us. So, sir, good to see you. Uh, time as a commandant was an interesting time, and, and we can talk about that. I know I've, I've had people approach me that want to talk about Force 2030 and all that, and I'm happy to take questions on that. Uh, some rules, though, I, I'm not going to talk about politics. I'm not going to say anything about any president that I happen to have contact with or serve with. I'm not going to talk about any policy things. I'll talk about Marines and I'll talk about, give you my opinion, my opinion of things in the world. You'll see, you'll see right away that it's focused a lot on China, which is I think a t is kind of contemporary based on what's been going on recently in Taiwan and other things. Uh, and it's a difficult problem. And I've thought a lot about it, I've wrote about it. When I, have a, when I can't sort my thoughts out, you, I've learned if you can't write it down, in a coherent, logical way, you can't express your thoughts on things. And so we can talk about China, and we all have our opinions, and it's a difficult, it's not a partisan issue. Just like how to deal with Russia is not a partisan issue. How to deal with Iran is not a partisan issue. How to deal with the North Koreans is not a partisan issue. It's an American issue. And it, it doesn't deserve, it deserves serious, thoughtful discussion not a bunch of 
chippiness on one side of the aisle or other, but that's just my opinion. So let's take a look. So this is kind of the world we used to know, the world that we, some people opine for, you know, when it was the United States and the Soviet Union, World War II ends, and there's two powers in the world, the United States and the Soviet Union, and we go through the Cold War, and Ronald Reagan becomes president, you know, Gorbachev tear down this wall, and toward the end of the 80s, Soviet Union just kind of disintegrates, goes away, become a non-entity, and then forces go to Desert Shield, Desert Storm, General Key's got second division, General Myers got first division, uh, General Boomer's the MEF commander, General Schwarzkopf's the big commander, we defeat the Iraqi army, and the United States is it. There's no competitor, nobody. You remember President Bush's thousand points of light, huge peace dividend, we're gonna draw down the force, what do we need NATO for? There's no threats. China was a rural backwater country that had been recognized back in 72 with Kissinger and, and uh, Nixon. We had actually said there's one China, the one China policy, remember that? And then that eventually, you know, China Relations Act and all that and you know, strategic ambiguity and it got complicated. But that's the way we saw the world. The world was based on the United States, in the rest of the world. And the Atlantic was the ocean that we focused on. Asia was an afterthought. It's where they, all the cheap stuff came from, right? Now, there were times when Japan rose up and you know, people were studying the Japanese and their methods of management. Remember that? You know, and, and nobody talks about that anymore, right? Because they were, they were economically being much more successful than us. So it was a Soviet Eurocentric thing we worried about the Middle East because of energy. You know, we have the Arab-Israeli wars, the 67 war, the 73 war, Sadat's murdered. Things kind of go along, even though we've got this terrorist group that attacks our embassies in 1998 in Kenya and Tanzania, and then New York bombing at the basement of the Trade Towers, and then 9-11 happens and everything changes. Everything changes. You know, I was at, set, I was at uh, head, Second Marine Division headquarters and you know, we're sitting in our office. General Blackman was the division commander and somebody comes and says, hey, you gotta turn on the TV. Think about, you know, you know everybody, you know, it's like, where were you on 9-11, right? Hey, come on, turn on the TV. Somebody just flew a plane into the World Trade Tower. Nobody, that didn't happen. And you turn on the TV and then there's a second plane. And then a tower comes down. And then the plane hits the Pentagon. And we're at war. And we stayed at war for 21 years. We're still at war. A different kind of war. So we go into Afghanistan. We end up invading Iraq, but there was still it was really no one to contest us, militarily, politically. Russia was still a Baptist case, China was developing an economic capability. We still thought, well, if we trade with them, there's a really good book by a guy named Pillsbury called uh, The, the, the 20, 100 Year Marathon. And he admits he was wrong, he said, I thought if we, if we had economics with them, they'd become democratic. What a mistake. So we go through this whole period of time. We're focused on the Middle East. We're focused on terrorism because that's where we were concerned with. We became an, in, we actually over this period of time became a, a net exporter of oil and fossil fuels in the United States. So the Middle East for oil was became not really that big of a deal. Russia becomes a very powerful oil exporter and China becomes this huge economic engine where Americans keep going over there and invest and we, we send business over there. We send it over places, but 
you know, we end up becoming dependent. The supply chain becomes much, much more dependent on, on the Chinese market than maybe we, looking back at it now, we should have allowed. But we were still the one power. Now, the world's changed. We're in a post-9-11 world. There's a multipolar world out there. In other words, we are not the only superpower. Russia never lost their nuclear weapons. Ukraine had nuclear weapons, and they gave them up. They gave them up. We actually, uh, Gordon Nash went over there from Tumaf and with a force and, and was part of the force that the Ukrainians gave up those weapons under the guise that will provide you security. Russia never lost their nukes. Vladimir Putin continues his rise through the government there. Uh, China becomes more and more powerful, economically more powerful, become politically much more assertive. Um, they become very, very active, and all countries do, become very, very active in cyber and espionage. This is all open press. I mean, I'm not telling you, most of you, you are. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but I'm reminding you. So we sat there, and we were aware that, I believe we were aware that, and not that we weren't doing similar things to them, but we were allowing them to steal their intellectual property. <laughs> Copyrights, they were violating copyright laws, they were making copies of movies, they were selling them around the world, and we were all indignant about that, but we continued to invest in China. So the world, though, I mean, the Pacific becomes the center. It kind of goes back to where it was after the defeat of Nazi Germany. So the, ninth, the 2018 uh, National Defense Strategy, when, Secretary, when General Mattis was Secretary of Defense, was a pretty good document. It still is although there's been some mods to it, they still have not, they were gonna pass a new national defense strategy, but when the Russians invaded Ukraine, they pulled it back. But the national defense strategy, which was a very collaborative document, I remember there were like 65 or 66 iterations of that document, and then the, the General Mattis, Secretary Mattis, did a really good job of making sure everybody got to see it. So when it came out, it was no surprise to us. But the, the document says three things. Uh, we need to increase the lethality and readiness of the force. We need to maintain and improve alliances and partnerships. And we need to improve the business processes of the Pentagon. We need to do a better job getting value for our money. OK? And then it said there's four threats out there, actually four plus one, but the first two We've had these same four threats, but basically it took them from four and one to two and three. China and Russia, and then North Korea, Iran, and then terrorism. That's the threat. And he told, he said, Navy forces, naval forces, Marines and Navy, your pacing threat, and a pacing threat is what you measure yourself against. Your pacing threat is China. You get ready to go fight China because there's a big ocean out there, the international date line. I mean, it's six, 7,000 miles across the Pacific. You need to reread re our history on World War II. And he told the Army, you focus on the continental fight, Europe, and the Air Force and Special Ops, you be prepared to support against any of these campaigns. So China has become a very powerful nation. 1.3 billion people. I mean, we can't, you can't beat demographics. Um, they will, in my opinion, eventually have the largest economy in the world. And they have become not just copiers of technology, but developers of technology. And so we used to consider them a near peer Although I personally have never used that term. They're a peer. In some cases, based on certain capabilities, I'd say we're the near peer. And they have many advantages. 
but they've got strong economy, they've got an incredible technological base, and they are very, very, very good at using information. So we don't see their information, because we don't read Chinese media. We don't see Chinese television. We don't read Chinese Twitter accounts. We don't read uh, ByteDance or TikTok. Your children do. Anybody here read, do TikTok a lot? Watch the videos? Yeah, okay. One, two. You know, Instagram. Most of us, it's a pretty, I will be quiet. This is a very experienced group in this room, okay? We don't do social media. That fight goes on every day for hearts and minds of people. And the Chinese are very good. So not just after the, secret, uh, the Speaker of the House's visit, all the time they're out there marketing their view of the world and, more importantly, what they see about the United States. And you would read it and you go, that's ridiculous, that's total baloney, that's not true. But if you're reading, you're out somewhere in the world and you read that, what the, you go, well, where is the contrary view of this? Where is the United States counter narrative? Where does the United States attack this view? Unless you watch US television. And the Russians are very good at this. Anybody ever watch RT, Russian television? RT today? Yeah, it's worth your time. It's total, it's total baloney, but these, these Regimes, they control the media in their country. You know, they can say, I don't want to listen to Fox, I want to listen to CNN, I don't want to listen to MSNBC, or I want to listen to something else. They can't, people can't say that. They get to listen to what they get to listen to. And so they hear what they hear. And we all are learning the power of information. But that's the world view that we need to take. Not that Europe's not important, not that NATO's not important, not that European Union's not important, not that Russia and Ukraine is not important. But of those five threats I mentioned, four of them are here. Russia's in the Pacific, China, North Korea, and terrorism. It's a huge terrorist threat in the Philippines and Malaysia. Different forms of Al Qaeda. There's U.S. Special Forces have been in the Philippines for years and years and years working with the Filipinos to fight terrorism down in uh, Mindanao and the islands that lead up into Malaysia. Thailand's been fighting an insurgency for years. And the Chinese are out there doing what they do, which is this. Selling their products, buying ports, buying airfields, doing port concessions, doing railroads, getting mineral rights, paying people money, buying off politicians. They, are, they have, as, as Secretary Spencer, Richard Spencer, former Secretary of the Navy said, they have, and there are many business people, they have operationalized capital. They have operationalized capital for political use. And not that we don't do that, but not to the degree, because they've got huge pots of money. And quite frankly, they're not concerned about the rule of law like we are, my opinion. And they're not concerned as we are, rightfully, concerned about human rights. So if you, if you read what's going on in uh, Sri Lanka recently, you know, the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka had to resign because there was huge inflation, there was all sorts of corruption because the Chinese had come in and bought the port concession in the Colombo, their capital. And it didn't work out well. I just read today that uh, Israel had sold the port concession in Haifa to a Chinese commercial company. And we had complained to them, and they, so they changed the contract, they gave it to an Indian company. Because the U.S. Navy said, we're not coming into Haifa if the Chinese control the port. So all around, and it goes beyond this. I mean, it's Sri Lanka, Cambodia, Iran, Pakistan. They got a port, a place called Gwadar. They've built a naval facility 
just nearby to ours at uh, Djibouti. They're down in Kenya. They're on the western coast of Africa. You know, they're working with the Nigerians. They're in this hemisphere. Of course, they've got Cuba, they've got Venezuela, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So they're very, very, very active. And they're also active in the Pacific. So recently was the 80th anniversary of the battle for Gu Guadalcanal, the Guadalcanal campaign. And you may have read recently that the Solomon Islands, 100 islands just north of Australia, were bought by the Chinese because they recognized Taiwan as China. Taiwan paid them. China paid them more money. So if you study, it, you can't see it from here, but from Hawaii all the way out here, there is a whole string of islands. Fiji, Samoa, Tonga, the Caroline, the Marshalls, Micronesia, Oceania, Palau, all sorts of islands that are all have airfields and ports. They have airfields and ports. So we need access to those airfields and ports. So does China. China wants to deny them to us. So we've got to get out there and we have to, you know, we can't just say, well, don't take the Chinese money. Again, my opinion. And the, if I'm living in Palau and I've got a bunch of people that are suffering and levels of poverty on these different islands, I go, well, okay, I don't really want to work with the Chinese, but what are you going to give me? What are you going to give me? You're going to build schools, you're going to give me fresh water, you're going to give me electricity. You want to use my port, you want to use my airfield, I got, I got to get something, right? So we've got to compete. We've got to compete with China. Not just in this part of the world, but in Africa, in Asia, and in this hemisphere. So this one belt run road is for real, it's, and it's beyond. If you can go on, online and just Google one belt, one road. A map and you'll see all the places the Chinese are spending money in Europe. I mean they don't own the port, it's still in Italy, but if they own the they they own both ends of the Panama Canal are run by Chinese commercial port operational companies. So I mean they're making money, but are they not part of or, or, or party to what the Chinese government wants? So they're, they're very smart. I mean, I am not belittling them. They're very smart. They're very clever. They have a plan. They're very patient. And it's all, it's a 100-year plan. It's supposed to end in 2049. 2049, 100 years since they became a, when they drove Chiang Kai-shek out of mainland China to Taiwan. Keep pushing the wrong button. So probably more familiar, this is the South China Sea. So China has this historical thing called the Nine Dash Line. There's no legal precedent to this, but they believe, just like they believe probably with even more legal precedent, Taiwan is part of China. They said these area here is part of China's territorial waters. And in the 20, 2010 to 2014, 2015, they went out on coral outcroppings in this area and they did sand reclamation and they built islands. And they built, on those islands, they built bases. Now, President Xi was called out on this by President Obama. He said, we will never militarize these islands. He lied. They have airfields, they have air defense. And so now you read about freedom of navigation by the United States Navy because we do not recognize this as sovereign Chinese soil, and so it can't be territorial waters. Territorial waters are 12 miles off the sovereign ground territory of a nation. And then some nations have claimed further areas like economic exclusion zone for fishing and minerals. So the Filipinos have claims out here. The Brunei have a claim out here. The Vietnamese have claims out there. The Malayans have claims out, have claims out here. And they actually went to court. They went to international court and they cited the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and the court found in their favor that the Chinese had violated the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. 
The only problem is the United States hasn't signed that. We have not signed the UN Convention, even though every service, senior service member in the United States of America for the last 15 years has recommended the President of the United States that the Senate confirm this treaty and we sign it. So we have no legal basis to contest them because we're not signatories to the treaty. We had uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership that was negotiated during the Obama administration. Now, maybe not the best deal, I don't know. And you remember during the 2016 campaign, both candidates said, no, nah, it's a bad deal. So we didn't sign it. We had wrapped up trade with all these countries out here. Japan, Korea, Taiwan, the Philippines, Vietnam. And we didn't sign it. The Chinese immediately came in and, and negotiated their own agreement. So if you're absent, you're absent. Um, views of others, you know, this is, you know, Taiwan, I, I just recently, uh, Secretary of State Blinken gave a big speech, I think it was the 9th of June, very critical speech at some Asian forum about China, you know, criticizing this or criticizing them for that. And he met with his counterpart, and his counterpart gave him a 25-page letter with his response to Blinken's criticism. It's, it's open press. You can I, you go, to, go to Google and type it. But Chinese letter to Secretary of State Blinken. And it goes down. You said this. This is why this is false. You said this. This is why it's false. I mean, they talk about Taiwan. So the Chinese, I mean, I'll advocate for the Chinese. So in the Cairo Declaration at the end of World War II, the Allied powers said, because remember, Formosa had been under Japanese control during the war. Japanese, Japan had invaded Formosa or Taiwan. And they said, Taiwan goes back to China, which they meant Chiang Kai-shek and nationalist China. Well, then when, the, when Mao's army defeated Chiang Kai-shek and drove him to Taiwan, and then in 72, when uh, the United States recognized one China, the Chinese say, well, you recognize one China, and the Cairo Declaration that you signed said, Taiwan is part of China. Why isn't Taiwan part of China? That's a very good question, based on treaties and legal documents. But then we've signed the China Relations Act, and you know, we want the Taiwanese people to decide for themselves. I mean, and the current government there does not want to have be assimilated into China. Even though before President Xi, the previous president of China said, we can have uh, one nation, two systems. That was kind of the deal in Hong Kong, right? We, the Brits signed a deal. They said, you have one, one nation, two systems. You'll recognize democratic rights in Hong Kong. And we've seen how that's gone. They have, they have not, they, they failed to, to uh, honor their treaty. So there's a bunch, you know, the, you can throw mud all day long and say, you signed this, you said this, you didn't do that. But my, I guess my point is, the United States, if, if we're going to negotiate with these folks, which we have to do, we don't want to go to war. We don't want to go to war. And because I don't, I, it would be very difficult. There's another open press article, the Council for Security and International, uh, what, CSIS, what do they stand for? Didn't you work for them? Didn't you? Anyway, it's a DC think tank. They've done 17 war games on defending Taiwan. And they were gonna publish the results in open press. And recently they said, well, it, yeah, it was successful, but the United States lost like all their airplanes. <laughs> and the island was decimated. So wh what do we want? I mean, we sit here and chip on each other and throw insults back and forth and say bad things about each other. I was recently, uh, one of the things I do, I work for National Defense University as a mentor, and we had all the, one, the brand new one-star admirals and generals down at Norfolk, and they put, run them through a four-day uh, training event 
and we talk about joint operations and different things, and then you break into seminars and you kind of talk about what you want. So one of the guys in the room had been in the National Security Council uh, for both the Trump and the, and the Biden administration, and he had worked the China thing, and, and he goes, you know, I, nobody ever asked, what do we want from China? What do we want? What do we want from China? So I made a list. I think is what we want. Now, can we get all these things? They want stability on their terms. They want, the Chinese word is harmony. We want harmony, we want, which means you do what we say. But we don't want to go to war. We want peace and stability. We want free and fair trade. So the, the Trump administration, $300 billion tariffs are still in place under the current, under the current administration. $300 billion in tariffs. Should we lift those tariffs after what they just did after Pelosi's visit? Because they got tariffs on us. So if you want free and fair trade, should you lift the tariffs? Can we agree on something? Stop stealing my intellectual property. Stop hacking my nets. Stop stealing my personal information. Stop hacking the national government of the United States. And they would say, you do the same thing. OK, well, we can talk about it. I remember the Chinese came when I was the J3, and Pete mentioned it. And General Dempsey was the chairman. And we had lunch. So I'm sitting there with these Chinese generals. And everybody's a little, everybody's a little bowed up, you know, like. And this guy goes, why do you fly reconnaissance flights along our coast? So you trying to spy on us? I said, yes. He says, what would you do if we did that to you? He said, oh, that's a really good question. I hadn't thought about it. So you imagine if the Chinese flew just 13 mile reconnaissance flights off the west coast, of, uh, flew out here off California with a surveillance aircraft to do electronic surveillance. We do that to them every day. So what do we want? We want to bind with international laws and treaties. The Chinese are huge violations of laws on fishing. They fish in everybody's water, and they're, they're raping the seas of fish to feed 1.3 billion people. They try to have an air defense identification zone in the South China Sea, and we just blow it off. They fly up into the air defense identification zone, they and the Russians, mostly the Russians, off of Alaska all the time. You see it in the news. Hey, they violated the ADIS, and then we fly planes out, escort them out. They're testing our reaction. What about arms control? The United States uh, previous administration withdrew from the interna uh, inter uh, International Nuclear Forces treaty, was, which had short-range ballistic missiles under 500 kilometers, the United States withdrew because the Russians were cheating. But we still have agreed with the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, which limits the number of nuclear warheads for the Russians in the United States to 1,500. China won't sign. Why not? Because they don't have 1,500 yet. And they don't want to be disadvantaged. So how does it stop? I've read some people say, well, we should build more. Well, OK, how many nuclear weapons do you need? I'm not again, I mean, we need nuclear weapons. The Russians are not going to get rid of their nuclear weapons. The Chinese are not going to get rid of their nuclear weapons. The North Koreans, President Trump tried very mightily to try to get Kim Jong-un to give up his nukes. And the Iranians, you know, still are in the process of working that capability. And we'll talk about that in a second. So what do we want? To, what do we want? You know, is there some place where we can get agreement? And then I just read here recently, President Xi sent a note to Biden saying, hey, we don't need to get all excited right now. We don't need to go to war. 
because Xi's up for his unprecedented third term as a president of China, and he's got huge problems right now because he's got all these people that paid all this money to build all these houses, and the real estate company went bankrupt. So he's got domestic issues. So where can we agree? Can we cooperate on climate control? Can we cooperate on energy? Can we cooperate on medical stuff? Do we still want Chinese students to come here and go to school? The numbers are 50, down 50% this year, and it's going to kill our universities. Why? Because they charge them the maximum amount of money. Chinese kids pay full freight to go to big schools. And maybe we even gouge them a little bit in our university to make money. And then they go home, and then what happens to them? So I don't know, but I think we have to answer this question, and maybe that's the basis for some kind of, I'm not trying, I'm not naive. I'm not a diplomat. But the purpose of our military is to deter someone from attacking us, and if we have to go fight, to beat them, to break them. But you don't want to, if you don't have to do that, you want to deter them. So if we don't start to figure out where we can have common ground, it doesn't, I don't see how it ends well. So we talked a little bit about this part of the world. This is a Bandab, Al Mab, Djibouti's over here. That's Somalia. You see Saudi Arabia. You see Iran. India, the second most populous country in the world, very much has issues with China on their northern border up in the mountains. The United States has reached out trying to engage with China, and the Indians, as they've always been, kind of remain non aligned and don't want to get overly committed. Uh, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the JICPOA. So the Trump administration withdrew from the JICPOA that was negotiated by the Obama administration, went to the uh, maximum pressure campaign, and then the Biden administration went back in to try to, to reinstitute the JICPOA, even after we killed Soleimani. No tears shed here. So should we go back in? So they're in Vienna right now. I mean, it, the thing kind of fell apart, and the Europeans came in. Remember, there's the, the Europeans, the Russians, the Japanese, the Chinese, the United States, and the Iranians are all part of this group to negotiate the JICPO. And the Iranians want all the sanctions lifted, and we're like, no, you got to do these things. There was a discussion, should the IRGC or the the Iraqi or the Iranian Republican Guards, which we have listed as a terrorist organization, should they be taken off the terrorist list? And the answer pretty much has been no. I mean, that's probably one of the guys that was allegedly trying to kill Ambassador Bolton, right? So that maybe the Iranians said, okay, you can keep them on the list. It's not going to stop them from doing what they do. I've talked to Israelis who say, you know, I don't like the, I don't like the JICPOA, but the one thing the JICPOA did, it did two things. It let us, it let us watch their nuclear program, and it bought us time. It bought us time. So I don't know what's going to happen. In the meantime, since previous administration withdrew from it, Iran has further developed their nuclear capability. They have gotten closer to where they could, if they wanted to develop a nuclear weapon. They have the technological know-how. So this is not a small thing. I mean, what are we going to do if we wake up tomorrow and they, blow, they, they do a nuclear detonation? And I'll never say never. Probably one of the best things that the Trump administration did in foreign policy was the Abraham Accords, where they got an agreement between uh, Jordan, Bahrain, Qatar and the UAE to recognize Israel. Now you got Israeli airplanes landing in, in uh, Dubai. Trade and discussion, international fence. And if we could get the Saudis, that would be huge. 
but that doesn't change the fact that Hezbollah is to the north, Hamas and Palestinian and Islamic Jihad is to the south, and the Iranians say Israel doesn't have the right to exist. So how am I supposed to negotiate with that? You say I have no right to exist? Okay. So that issue remains. Afghanistan, we're gone. We could talk about it. Decisions made. You know, you can argue about the decision. You can argue about the, the way it was conducted. You can argue about the fact that we lost nine Marines, a corpsman, and a Navy, an Army staff sergeant. God rest their souls. But we're gone. And is, is Afghanistan in the news anymore? No. Occasional story about women being oppressed in Afghanistan, but we knew that was going to happen. Saudi, um, president was just there, talked to crown prince, tried to get him to make, pump some more oil. The Saudis and the Iranians are still fighting a proxy war in the north part of Yemen even though there's been a tree ceasefire for four months. And then the UAE is with uh, Mohammed bin Zayed, who is the, kind of the crown prince. He's kind of westernized that. And probably got the, if ever, anybody been to UAE? It's a wonderful place for that part of the world. And, you know, there's seven million people there. A million of them are Emiratis. The rest are expats doing all the work. So, but the Chinese are there, we're competing with them in all these places, same as in Egypt. Or the Russians, and the Russians, we didn't even talk about Syria and Assad, and U.S. forces are still in Iraq, small number. There still is U.S. forces in Syria. There's a huge prison camp. Remember, we, you know, Al-Qaeda, we bombed them, we defeated them, and then the, North, the uh, Democratic Alliance up there, Massoud, or Assad, they got a huge prison camp up there. It's full of uh, Al Qaeda guys. And it won't be a problem until it's a problem. So, Africa, lots of energy here. Nigeria is a major exporter. You've got the Arab North, the Sub Saharas. South Africa's got political problems. Huge country, huge resources, huge potential. The Chinese are all over the place, and the United States is probably not there to the degree it can be there. And we don't have to be there militarily. We could be there medically. We could be there educationally. We could, we could be there with uh, economic support make fresh water, vaccinate kids against polio. But you've got to be there. Because people are emigrating into Europe because there's no jobs, it's not safe. There's terrorism. You've got Boko Haram in Nigeria. You've got Al-Qaeda in the, in the north, in Algeria and Libya. Libya is still at war after we kill Gaddafi. That place has never been sorted out. The Russians are in there. I mean, it's, it's not just China. And I haven't even talked about Turkey, you see there, and then you see the Black Sea, and you see Ukraine is north of that, and NATO and Italy. I mean, it's, everybody's struggling, whether it be COVID, the economy, whether it's inflation, whether it's supply chain. And then we've got a major war going on in the Ukraine. And if I told you that a year ago, you got to, ah, they never invade Ukraine. That's like when they sent us, when they sent us to Somalia, General. I got, I got a, President Bush isn't going to send us to Somalia. Merry Christmas. Get to go to Somalia. And then we got this hemisphere. 
you know, the Chinese are again active in Venezuela, the Russians are active in Venezuela, the Cubans, we, I've always believed personally, just recognize Cuba and get in there and sell them stuff and the whole communist thing will just go away. But the people in Miami would not like that because they still have the deeds and titles to their land. Um, We've got huge immigration. We were talking about that today. People coming across our southern border, mostly from, uh, well, from everywhere. There were Haitians for a while. There's people who come from the Middle East because there's a whole market of people that move them up and down to take them in there. Um, and they make money moving people. I live in Texas. I remember we were building our house. And it was, July, it was this time of year, and, and they, were, they had the landscape because the bank wouldn't let me close until I did my landscaping. And I'm like, my grass is going to die. Anyway, so the guy that runs a landscape company, he's a Texan, he's a white guy, and all his guys are out there working, and they're all Latino. And I said to him, I, this was 2019, I go, hey, Brett, how many of these guys are legal? He goes, you really want to know? I said, yeah, I do. I want to know. How many of these guys are legal? He goes, one. One of them? He says, yeah. I said, where do they live? He says, I don't know. They all live in a house, and they send all their money home to their families. I mean, if you stop, if you were able to magically snap your fingers and, and make everybody that was illegal in Texas go home, and no one could come across the border, there would be no home in construction. There would be no landscaping. There would be no road work, and all the restaurants were closed. It's fact. So I don't know what the answer is. I do know that the Chinese are active here. They're active in the United States. They try to buy ports. They try to buy areas down in San Diego. They try to buy property. They try to buy intellectual property. They invest in companies here in Silicon Valley. You've got a drug issue. You've got now a leftist president in Colombia. You've got Venezuela. Maduro is still the president, supported by the Russians, the Chinese, and the Cubans. Um, we need to sort out our own hemisphere. Because if we have to go do something, you can't be looking over your shoulder. And this is what you call interior lines. These are our interior lines. So, we spend probably more time and, and more, less time and less effort and less resources in our own hemisphere than we do anywhere else in the world. Now, I don't know if we, you know, you think about some guy in Guatemala or Honduras who comes north to get a job because his family, because his government's corrupt. Is he going to stay there if, if uh, somebody goes down there, opens a factory, and he gets a job? Is he not going to come north? I don't know. Would you come north if you could work and stay home and be with your family? I mean, it's, it's kind of a simplistic view of it, but, you know, we can't be everywhere and do everything, but I, I, my personal view is we need to spend more time talking to these guys and working with them. They got elections coming up. Bolsonaro is going to run for president against, against a guy, Lulu, who was in prison for corruption, and now he's come out, and he's going to run, and he might win. I don't know if that's good or bad. I just read that the... Interest rate in Argentina now, you can get 70% on your money because inflation is 70% in Argentina. And so they raise the interest rate to 70%. So be careful what you ask for. So I'll just leave this up because I know I'm probably way over time. Actually, I'm right on time. So what, you know, so what do you worry about? I worry about us. I worry, I worry about our political discord. I worry about the fact that, even though I think it happens more, I, I saw Senator Blumenthal and, and Senator Lindsey Graham on uh, TV on Sunday, and they're talking about cross the aisle collaboration and cooperation amongst you know the Democrats and Republicans. And Graham goes, you know, it's, it's not as bad as you think. Okay, show me. Show me. We've got to do something about immigration. Uh, civil military relations. 
there is concern. I mean, there's civil, you know, about, you know, should the military, how politically oriented is the military now? I mean, I, I was telling, we played golf today with, with Kevin O'Brien, and I said, I don't ever remember anybody ever talking about politics until the last few years I was in. It didn't even come up. Nobody put stickers on their car, and we did not a thing. And now it's become, because the whole environment has become politicized because of social media and the media. We could spend all day talking about artificial intelligence, America's reputation in the world, is it good or is it bad? Uh, are we supposed to be the police force for the world? Are we the leader of the democratic world? Are we supposed to contest all despots and autocrats? What's our job? What's our job? I mean, since the end of World War II, that's been our job. What is, you know, the, you know, gleaming city on a hill of Ronald Reagan, right? We're supposed to be the example. And democ democracy is a messy business, but it's better than everything else, or so has been said. So I worry about this. I worry about, and I think most of you know, if you don't know, our military is a volunteer. It's actually an all recruited force. All our services are going to miss the recruiting goals this year, except for Colonel Jones. He made his goals, so he's a hero. But the active force is going to miss the recruiting goal. So are we going to bring back the draft? I don't see that. But then what do you do if you don't have a sufficient number of people that are quali of quality? So I could go on. Um, I don't think it's all doom and gloom. I, 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 I do. I, I still believe that <clears throat> when it comes down to it, if you've traveled, and many of you have, as I have, and you talk to people and they take their opportunity to pick on the United States and they yell at you and they complain about you, what you do or U.S. policies, and you go up to them afterwards and you go, hey, you know, you were a little hard on me in there, but I got to ask you this question. If you had to live, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would you want to live? The answer is always the same. I want to live in the United States because that's, I have opportunity there and, and people are measured by their effort and their merit. I can make something of myself. I can make a better life for my family. And I think that's why most people come up to the border. Yeah, there's some criminals in there, but they want, they just want to take care of their family. So how do we facilitate that in a measured way? I don't know. I don't know. Right now, it's not, it's not working. So with that, I will uh, be happy to take your questions. And I'll stay, if you have to leave, it's it, actually the clock has run out. I'll stay here until, you tell me to stop. Okay, I guess I get to jump in here. Yes, sir. Um, I've got a couple of questions that have come up already, but I'm going to start with this one. Now that you've had uh, about three years away from your commandancy and time to reflect on that, and of course you've got some benefit of hindsight, is there anything that you uh, might have done differently, or is there, are there things that you wish you would have had more time to get done? You never have enough time. You never have enough time to get stuff done. And you know, I had a whole list of things, and I gave it to General Burke. I said, here's all the stuff I'm working on that didn't get done. And that some of it's gotten done here recently. It's always interesting, though. It was, it was never the idea of the people that came before you. It's always the new person's idea. It's like, okay, fine. As General Gray used to say, it doesn't, is, you know, you get a lot of stuff done if you worry, don't worry about who gets the credit. But like Mike Rock and I, we worked on pros and cons and 360 degrees and different promotions and... The, and it's all happened. But it wasn't Rocco or Neller that did it. It was some other people who stole all our stuff. No, we just, it's fine. Did I make mistakes? Sure, I made mistakes. I, 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 don't, think I, I don't think I appreciated the information space and the power of information as much as I could have. I got better at it. 
And I realized I was weak. I, you know, I would say, you know, never go in front of a press conference and say, I don't do social media, because all the young Marines think you're stupid. They think you're stupid. Just don't say that. But I realized I was weak, so I hired 10 Lance Corporals to do social media for me. And they killed it. They had their own TV show. They'd make jokes. They were on all the time. They would, I would go in anywhere I went anywhere. I had a Twitter account. The Commandant had a Twitter account, not Bob Neller. And, and we would do, we would took pictures and we would tweet, hey, we we're here, we saw these folks, they're doing a great job. Because parents, friends, they think, hey, I saw the Commandant tweeted about you. It's a big deal. And you get out your message, you say, you know, well done, you're working hard, all your things. Work hard, be disciplined, be focused, stay sober, respect your fellow Marines, fight and win. Boom, boom, boom. Just constantly beat that message. I mean, I, there were some four structure things I wish I had done, uh, but You know, at the end, it's not for me to judge. You know, it'll be for history and posterity to decide if I did a good job or not. Uh, joining in 1975 was a tough time for the Corps. In your perspective, how bad was it when you, and, and when did you notice the Corps getting, quote, better? Well, there's people here that served in Vietnam, and the end of the war was the end of the war, and, and you remember now, you gotta put it in context. So in 1968, Martin Luther King and Robert F. Kennedy are, mur are killed, assassinated. Huge race riots, right? We remember that, right? I mean, they burned down LA, DC, Detroit, a bunch of cities. And so the, the, the black Marines, African Americans in the service were really upset. Huge racial issues, drug problems. We lost our discipline. The draft wasn't working. And I came into that in the middle of it, and thank God people like General Myatt, Ernie Cheatham, Marty Brantner, uh, Hank Stackpole, they stuck around and showed us what right looked like. And then when Reagan became president, we got money because our gear was crap. And then I remember 1981, I got a 17% pay raise as a captain. And I needed it because my home mortgage was 14% from my condo in, La in, in Oceanside. I had a 14% mortgage. So we loved, and then, we, then all of a sudden, you know, General Barrow and then General Kelly, we got, we started getting new stuff. We got Humvees, and we got new rifles, and we got new uniforms, and we got ammo, and we could train, and we're going to the field, and we started getting better people. And I think Desert Shield, Desert Storm was kind of the graduation exercise for all that. So it, it, it was a lot of hard work. And some people, well, why'd you stay? I said, I like being a Marine. I like being in an organization where almost 100 over 100, if somebody told you they were going to do something, they did it. And if you didn't do it, you got your ass chewed. Rightfully so. And you stood at attention and took your whipping. And then they usually said, OK, don't do that again. Go back to work. It was business. One personal. And then people would pull you aside and even some of the tough old guys and, you know, what are you doing? Or do you think about this? Or you did really good at that. You know, just enough to keep you, keep you from getting discouraged. So I have no regrets. I mean, but it was tough. And I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that enough of my friends, enough of us stuck around, and, and we were able to work hard and try to make it a better, a better place. 
Here's one. Uh, what are your thoughts on lowering standards to meet recruiting goals? No. So when I came, I remember the first platoon I stood in front of was second platoon, Lima Company, 3-4. And I had 50% high school grads. Now, there were some good Marines in there. And there were some horrible Marines in there. Today, we're at 99.9% .9 high school grads. And I, I, I just don't see how trading quantity for quality is a winning proposition. I'd rather have a smaller Marine Corps. But at some point, you can get too small where you become, you lose capability. So everybody in here is a recruiter. I mean, I'm deputizing you officially today under my, under my uh, authorities as a former commandant. You're, if you've got some young man or woman out there in your community or in your church or family that you think would do well, you need to chat them up about going in the military. I mean, that's a pretty good deal. It's a better deal than it was back in 1975. I mean, you get pretty good pay, and if you can do four years and get an honorable discharge, you get a full ride scholarship to a four year college in your pocket. And you're probably gonna be employable, and, and you might like it but they got to want to do it. Who was the most impactful NCO you had while you were a young officer? I was very fortunate in that I, I generally had really good staff NCOs. I mean, my first platoon sergeant was a guy named Joe Houle. He had been a, in Vietnam infantry in the 60s. He got out. He came back in. He eventually retired as a sergeant major. And, and he grabbed me, and, and we had a long chat, and we became, you know, he, he told me what he thought he needed to do, and he gave me advice. And our company gunning was a guy named Jim Jones. Not Jim Jones, it became Commandant, but Jim Jones. I've lost track of Gunny Jones. I remember he, he very, very, he always was reading a book and smoking a pipe. But he was a tough dude. And, uh, and they used to grab me because I was, a, I was not a very good lieutenant. And they'd grab me and go, Lieutenant, why did you argue with the captain again? I was so stupid. I don't know why we're doing this. Sir, stop. And they grabbed me and sit me down and counsel me. And, but, you know, along the way, I, I, ran in, I ran into an incredible number of, of senior enlisted guys and gals who, you know, gave me great advice. And I, I mean, they were all very smart, capable people. Maybe they didn't have a chance to get, educate, get a formal education. They were street smart. They were intelligent. They were articulate. They are tough. And so, I, I, I mean, I was blessed. I mean, I, I can only think of a couple people I met that I just, we just didn't figure, didn't get along. They wanted me to be something that I wasn't going to be. Everybody else, uh, pretty impressive. So I was lucky. In some recent talks, you've spoken about the influence that this particular book had on you. Ray Kurzweil's book, uh, Singularity is Near. <laughs> What would you like folks to know about that book? I'm a history major from a state university, but I believe in technology, and I believe that it's not the end all to be all, but it's gonna help us solve a lot of our problems. So Kurzweil writes about um, technologies, not just arithmetic, but exponential rise in our world. And I think you see it, I mean, medical, particularly in the medical field. I mean, there's no way we would have been able to develop the COVID vaccines if we had not had an algorithm to allow us to test all these different combinations and permutations. Genetic manipulation is here. There's ethical issues with that. Uh, you know, machine learning, 
is going to make machines smarter is probably, I think in 10 years, there'll be no line haul trucking on the United States interstate that's driven by human beings. They'll go to regional centers and smaller trucks driven by people will pick up the stuff and distribute it. And they'll all be powered by hydrogen or electricity. Uh, agriculture will be done by machines to include the picking of fruit and different things. So I, I just think that it's important to understand it because you can try to stop it, but it, it's, I don't think it's stoppable. And so it's going to disrupt labor markets. It's going to make people have to figure out how to do something different. So I just read a story about an Australian guy who's a mine, he's in the mining business and he's trying to get the head of the United Mine Workers in West Virginia to stop pushing coal and say, let's train all your guys to build solar panels. So they want a job. It doesn't have to be in a coal mine. They need a job. So let's take this workforce and let's train them to do something else. And I think that's been difficult. I mean, when the crash came in 2008, a lot of people lost their jobs. And people say, well, we're going to go back to the way it was. We're not going to go back to the way it was. I don't think we're going to go back to the way it was. There's no way there's going to be that many people employed by GM and Ford and Chrysler building cars because their machines are better. They're cheaper, they're faster, the quality's better. So those jobs are gone. Those jobs are gone. So you got to do something else, which makes education even more important. And I know many of you support education, and that's why I'm part of the Marine Corps Scholarship Foundation because it, we have to make the United States, we have to do a better job of motivating and educating our youth. Because if we really want to be competitive with the Chinese, we're not going to do it with material things, we're going to do it with our brains. That's my opinion. And Kurzweil just talks about artificial intelligence and whether it ever exceeds that of a human. It's, I mean, it depends on what you mean. If you're a Trekkie, you know, Commander Data was, was a, was a an AI-inspired character, but he was not a human being. And that made him crazy, because he wanted to be a human, but he couldn't. Because no machine can have emotion and, and feel senses the way we do. Do you agree with the Corps getting rid of tanks? <laughs> and has Ukraine shown us that tanks are too easily defeated? I'm not going to tell you what, I've expressed my views to General Berger about some of the decisions he made, and he's, I'm not the commandant anymore, so I support what he's doing. You know, I play golf. The rules say I can have 14 clubs in my bag. If I could carry 20 clubs, I'd carry 20 clubs. I want to have as many capabilities in my bag as I can. But here's the situation the commandant finds himself in. So the commandant has a checkbook and he can write a check for so many Marines. That number's fixed. And if he needs Marines to do something new that doesn't exist, he can't write a check for more Marines. He has to take Marines that he's already paid for, take them out of what they're doing, and move them into this new thing. And that old thing either gets smaller or it goes away. So he made the decision to get rid of tanks because he needed Marines to do other things. Okay. You know, the Russians have taken huge amounts of losses of their armor to javelin missiles that we gave the Ukrainians. I mean, I don't know if you've seen any of the YouTube videos. I mean, it's like killing baby seals. They're just slaughtered. But that's just because they, they look so inept and so poorly trained and so incapable it's hard to understand how they could be that bad, but the Ukrainians are just killing them. Now, does that mean armor doesn't have a place on the battlefield? Remember what the National Defense Strategy told the Marine Corps. China's your pacing threat. You and the Navy, be prepared to contest China in the Pacific. Is there a place for armor there?
you know, so, you know, if you haven't followed it, I mean, there's been a big debate, a public debate of uh, many friends of General Myatt and people I've admired and known and, and, and listened to over my entire career about some of the changes in the Marine Corps. And what hasn't gotten much play is the Commandant has backed off on some of his stuff. He's put 200 Marines back in every infantry battalion. He's put the weapons platoons back in. He's added two more tubes of artillery. He's added more VMM squadrons. He's walked back some of his decisions. Has he gone far enough? I don't know. That's not my job anymore. So we continue to work on it, and uh, we'll see how it all ends up. So I really, I really appreciate it. I was reading some of your writings on, on LinkedIn, and I really appreciated uh, two in particular. One was your letter to America, and another one was your position on the Confederate flag. And my, my question is that, you know, it got me thinking about the social change that has often been at the forefront through the military, whether it be race, integration, sexual orientation, that sort of thing. My question is, what responsibility or role do you think the military plays today in trying to unify the country, given how polarized it is, or, or still making social change? I, I believe historically, and I can make this as an as a, as a accurate, uncontestable statement, the, Marine, the military, since the end of World War II, has led the nation in the integration of people of color and of sexual preference. Now, whether we wanted to do that or not, we were told to do that by our political leadership, and we did it. And, you know, I, I always, I am I'm, I'm probably a, I'm idealistic about that because I, the reason I stuck in the Marine Corps is I honestly believed in my heart of hearts that the Marine Corps was a merit-based organization and nobody really cared, I certainly didn't, where you came from, how much money you had, where your parents were from, what was the color of your skin or your religious preference or your sexual preference, man, woman, Latino, Christian, Gentile, Jew, Muslim. Nobody cares. They care about one thing, right? Get your job done. And if I get shot and I'm laying out in the middle of the road, bleeding out, are you going to come get my ass? And do you believe I'm going to come get yours? Because that's all that really matters. And as long as we, be, we remain an institution like that, I think we'll be fine. And if, the, if that inspires the nation to find their better angels as far as how we treat each other, then so much the better. Um, but it all starts, you know, with us and how we raise our kids. So, um, is that our role? Is that our mission? No, but I think it's a de facto thing that we do just because of the way we do our business. It always amazed me when we go to foreign countries and normally, you know, you go to a foreign country and, and the, the, your, your allied partner is kind of a homogeneous group of whatever the, na the nationality of that nation was. And then you fall out the Marines or the soldiers and, it, you know, it's all God's creatures, right? And they would go, how can you possibly all get along with each other? Those were Americans, right? I mean, unless there's a Native American here, none of our families came from here. We all came from somewhere else. That whole America is built on that. I'm not trying to be political, but the whole country is built on people coming here to have a better way of life. And if you show up, you work hard, you pay your taxes, you abide the laws, and you're a good person, welcome to the United States. Boom. That's it. So what happened? We're, we're not lost. We're just, I think we're just distracted right now. We'll get ourselves back together. Oh, you're killing me, Pete. Here, here's One another, more. Okay, here we go. 
This is a good one. Here's from the audience. What is your best advice to being an effective leader, especially to young personnel? You know, I, I've, I've been asked that, and it's a very difficult question. It's a complicated question because we all are different. We're all different people. We have different styles. But I think at the end of the day, I think it's very difficult for somebody to be inspired or want to follow somebody who doesn't exhibit virtue and character. Now, what do I mean by that? You know, if I asked you, if I asked you to close your eyes and think of the most, the person in your life that had inspired you, motivated you, uh, you know, to do better, to make yourself better, to improve yourself, and I said, what were the qualities of that person? I guarantee you, you'd say, well, they were smart, they worked hard, they were competent, they treated people with dignity and respect, they were humble, they told the truth, they accepted responsibility, uh, they worked really hard, they set a great example, they were sober and industrious, they still had fun, but they expected and held you to, to do your job and they held you accountable but no more than they held themselves. And if I asked you the opposite, who's the worst person you ever worked for? And you go, they were the opposite. They were lazy, they were selfish, they set a poor example, they didn't do, they, they didn't do what they said, they lied, they were deceitful, they treated people poorly, they were screamers, and they didn't know their job. So it's not complicated. It's, it's simple, but it's not easy. It's simple. It's not easy because it takes work. It's self-denial. Leaders are always in self-denial. Because once you think you're, start, you're good at it and you, you start to get too full of yourself, that's when you've got to step back and get the humility thing going again. So that's a long answer to a difficult question. Thank you, sir. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from Marines Memorial Association and Foundation. To learn more about the organization and our programs, please visit our website at marinesmemorial.org.